Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome you to the 2018 CANBAR Lecture on Innovations in Integrative Medicine, uh, presented today by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. And this um, year of 2018 marks 20 years that the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine has been in existence. I have the pleasure of serving as the director of the UCSF Osher Center. And that also gives me the pleasure of introducing a few very special guests. Um, first of all, um, Mr. Maurice Canbar, our wonderful innovator, is here. Thank you so much. Yes, the man of the hour, the Mr. Canbar, Canbar Lecture. Um, Another name you'll recognize is uh, Mr. Bernard Osher, our wonderful, faithful friend. Thank you so much. And we also have some members of our Osher Center Leadership Board, and I want to thank all of you for your, for your support and your creativity as we, as we move into the future. Um, the Osher Center was founded with a mission to provide the best integrative clinical care and the most innovative educational work and the most rigorous research, and we've had already a 20-year history of doing that. We put a special emphasis on health and wellness and making sure that what we do is accessible to everybody across society. So uh, health equity and, and uh, aspects of health justice are extremely important to us. Over the 20 years, we have not only expanded as a center, but the Osher centers have expanded. There are now six additional centers around the world. And I'm very happy to say that we have the coordinating center for all of those Osher centers here at UCSF, at the UCSF Osher Center. And that group provides all the infrastructure we need to be able to collaborate internationally on integrative medicine. So as we're poised to begin our next 20 years, I can't help but think of the, the spirit of uh, creativity and innovation that Mr. Canbar's work uh, represents, and also that of our guest speaker today. So I can't think of a, of a better pairing um, than having this event come together with these folks. So to give us a little bit more background on the Canbar lecture, I'm going to invite our research director, Dr. Rick Hecht. Thanks, Shelley. So um, the Canbar lecture has really been created to honor Mr. Maurice Canbar's generosity to the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, Mr. Canbar, as many of you may know, is really a renowned inventor and a highly creative person who has over 35 patents, some of which are, are really relevant to any of us in medicine, including the, um, the safety glide hypodermic needle, um, which a, a, as we heard some of us were spending time with Mr. Canbar a little earlier today and talk, he talked about that just the need to develop something like this in the midst of the AIDS epidemic that would protect healthcare workers from the, the risk of needle sticks. So he's done both creative invention, but inventions, some of which have really had a real impact on people's lives, including protecting people from things like HIV AIDS. Um, he's also the author of a, a book, Secrets from an Inventor's Notebook, uh, Advice on Inventing Success. Um, Mr. Canbar's support for the UCSF Osher Center Endowment is one of the things that really allows us to conduct groundbreaking research. Uh, as well as developing new models of care in our clinic and training a new generation of both physicians, nurses, and other healthcare workers who um, have training in integrative medicine approaches to healthcare. Um, we are really deeply grateful for Mr. Canbar's generosity to our center and his willingness to support the vision of his long term uh, friend, Mr. Bernard Osher. Um, who, as Shelley has said, is also uh, with us today. Um, we very much look forward to our continued collaboration with both of these visionary philanthropists. Um, and finally, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Helen Wing, one of our really innovative scientists um, who is studying mindfulness to introduce uh, our speaker. All right. So 
So John Kabat-Zinn is internationally known for his work as a scientist, writer, and meditation teacher, engaged in bringing mindfulness into the mainstream of medicine and society. He is professor of medicine emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where he founded the world-renowned mindfulness-based stress reduction course, which is also my first introdu serious introduction into meditation. Um, and he also founded the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine, Healthcare, and Society. He has authored numerous books, including Full Catastrophe Living and Wherever You Go, There You Are, which has, has been translated into over 10 languages. Fittingly enough, the concept of MBSR came to him while he was at a meditation retreat. For about 10 years after receiving his PhD in molecular biology at uh, MIT in 1971, he was pondering what his true life purpose was. Then while on retreat, he had an insight that lasted about 10 seconds. That was the inspirational seed for what is now known as the MBSR program. Um, and this utilizes the ancient practices of meditation and yoga to improve participants' quality of life. And I had the great honor to meet John as a young graduate student. He's very close with my graduate advisor, Rich Davidson. So as a young grad student, I had I actually heard him tell this story. Um, and I heard him describe the message that came to him as roughly, uh, I want to bring the Dharma into medicine. And it was really inspiring to hear how um, these messages could, could come to him during his practice. And of course, I was like, I, I want something like that. <laughs> um, and through over time and patience and deep listening, I, I've learned to cultivate my own internal intu intuitive listening while practicing, which I then try to encourage in my clients as well and is re have really witnessed some beautiful transformations. Um, and what I admire about John is that his own, his own authenticity activates authenticity in others. And I once heard someone tell John how much he admired him. And John responded, whatever you see in me, see that in yourself. And I think that's really how the power of his work continues to grow. Because um, as people learn from him and his work, then we all learn from each other. So it's my great honor to introduce Dr. John kabat -Zinn. <laughs> Well, it's an absolute delight for me to be here uh, and to gaze out at all of you and your faces. Helen, thank you for that magnificent, very kind introduction. And um, before we get started, even with other thank yous, uh, because of the essence and spirit of this talk, why don't we take a few moments to actually recognize that we've come into a room and we've all sat down together. Okay, and maybe I'll sit down too, just for fun. It's not like there's anything special about sitting, but God help us if we can't do it, you know? I mean, uh, so let's actually um, just bring awareness to the fact that uh, the body is in a seated position, okay? And you don't have to do anything particularly special or pious, like sitting up straight or looking meditative, but just be aware that there is sitting going on in the universe that you call yourself. And can you drop in on it? Can you actually feel, say, uh, the carriage of the head on the neck and shoulders? Can you feel the backs of your legs and, uh, and your butt on the cushion, on the chair? Can you feel your feet on the floor, if they're on the floor, or the legs crossed, or whatever? Can you feel sensation in the hands? Of course, the fact that you can feel any of this is miraculous. And there are people who can't. So that itself is an enormous gift that we usually completely tune out, that we can actually inhabit the body with full awareness and sensitivity, and therefore, be a little bit more present. There's something very interesting going on in the body, and that is that breathing is going on. Have you noticed? You're sitting here, but the body's also doing something. 
that thank God it doesn't need you to participate in. Because if it needed you, you're so unreliable, you would have forgotten and died long ago. <laughs> Got an e a text or something, whoops, dead. <laughs> so the brainstem and the, you know, the, the phrenic nerve and, um, and the diaphragm, it doesn't allow you actually anywhere near the you know, control knobs of this ongoing gift that we have of exchanging air with the world. So can we not take that for granted for a second and not inflate it or reify it into some big deal, but to just feel it? And in a sense, how we're being breathed. And how we can rest in an awareness of the entire field of the body as if we were actually in it, inhabiting not just the body, but the awareness of the body. And the answer is, yeah, of course we can. We're wired up that way. It's not like you have to get some special instruction. It's, it's, it's woven into the fabric of our humanness, is that this awareness can help us to actually be fully present in any moment and in every moment. Welcome, don't be sorry, no, just perfect. No matter what's going on. So from that point of view, from the stance that we're just taking towards the present moment and awareness, there are no interruptions. Okay. There's no, oh, something else is happening. No, what's happening is always happening and it's always what it is, and we don't have to like cognize it and explain it or say, oh yes, someone else came into the room or whatever. We can just be aware and not go into our heads. Why? Because there are other domains of intelligence that we are born with, one of which is like the magic of creativity and where that comes from, the magic of imagination and where that comes from, and it, it, it does come from what we call the human mind, but the fact is we don't have the slightest idea what the human mind is, or how that arises, or why it happens in some people in some ways and other people in other ways. But the beauty is that we, can, we all bathe in and participate in, not just the air that we're breathing in and out, but this capacity for dropping into full presence and wakefulness embodied in the body. And then to rest here in the present moment, which really means outside of time. Just now. And the interesting thing is that sometimes that can uh, manifest itself as silence and we could actually be silent for the rest of the hour. It would probably be the best talk I have ever given. <laughs> it takes a lot of courage, though, to do that, especially at a can bar lecture. <laughs> but don't worry, I won't keep it up too long. But the same awareness can manifest as conversation, can manifest as doing, it can manifest as research, it can manifest as clinical care can manifest, it had better manifest if it's clinical care, as actually caring. Remember what Peabody said, Francis France Peabody said, the secret of patient care is caring for the patient. Mm. And the doctors who round in the hospital are called attendings. And it would be a good idea to actually be fully present, to attend to the full spectrum of what's going on with the patient. Because the patients, we, all of us as humans, we know when you're not paying attention to us and you're lost in some kind of thought chain. Even if it's about diagnosis or differentials or whatever, it's a felt sense of separation when what we most need is 
connection. This is the heart of medicine. It's the heart of good medicine. And so let's just sort of extend the silence for a few more breaths where we're actually bathing in the air. The air is bathing us inwardly. The mind is simply open. And it doesn't have any agenda, so it doesn't have to think about anything or invent anything or come up with anything. But it's just at home. And rather than sort of on autopilot or asleep, it's simply awake. It's aware. And now why can't we just live this way all the time? I mean, the real meditation practice is not sitting full lo lo you know, in the full lotus, you know, like a statue in the British Museum or something like that. The real meditation practice, if we're talking about meditation and medicine, the real meditation practice is how much you're willing to show up in your life moment by moment by moment by moment, no matter what's happening. And sometimes what hap what's happening is supremely beautiful, and sometimes what's happening is supremely terrifying, horrific. And if it's not horrific for you, it's horrific for somebody else. All you need to do these days is turn on your television. Anderson Cooper is uh, a student of mindfulness. And if you watch him carefully while he's interviewing the, the students from the school in Parkland, Florida, see how present he is. See how present he was when he interviewed the second wife of, uh, of uh, the White House uh, Porter, Ron Porter. S just, it's a, it's a, it's a case study. I mean, it's, a, it's a magnificent example of how no training in psychology or anything like that. So nothing to interfere with his completely open presence with no agenda or, or commodifying or any kind. And just invitational, allowing the things to be expressed that millions of women need to hear because that's happened to them, but they don't have a vocabulary for it, and all of a sudden it's on CNN. So the, the value of transformation and healing really, in some sense, I will argue at least, lies in our individual and collective as a society or as a species or as a planet capacity to recognize hidden dimensions with our o within our own being, within our own heart, and then to inhabit them and not get so hijacked or diverted by the perpetual self-distracting and self-centeredness of our own thought stream, which I'm not knocking thinking. Thinking is fantastic. I mean, you know, without thinking, you wouldn't have any inve uh, invention. You wouldn't have any insights. But thinking is not our only intelligence. And we've reached a point, I think, in the evolution of the species where we need to recruit all of our intelligences in order to live with the actuality of our experience, the lives that are ours to live, and not the lives that our thinking mind says, now you're relegated to this, now it's all over for you, now you're to this, or you're to that, or this is why, or they're to blame, or it will never happen for. And all of those kinds of things that we believe are actually true it's just thinking. It's just thinking. And Einstein, I think, at one point, was, you know, commented in passing that I you're lucky if you have one or two good thoughts in your lifetime. I mean, most of them are like <laughs> just useless. So why reify them into the most important thing? When the most important thing is knowing that you're having a thought. That's called awareness. When do we get any training in that in school? Never, except if you're in school now. Because now, mindfulness is being taught in school for lots of reasons. One of which is, you know, when you went to school, didn't the teacher want the class to pay attention? And didn't the teacher often just get desperate to get the class's attention? 
Because why should the kids want to pay attention to the teacher? So often, like I'm a product of the New York public schools, you know, and the teachers would yell at us to pay attention. It's not that skillful. What about teaching the kids how to pay attention? Because it's actually, there's an architecture to it. There's a kind of geography to attending, whether you're a doctor or whether you're a, a, a first grader. It has a lot to do with listening, but, it, but, but also hearing. And let's make a distinction between listening and actually hearing, and then actually apprehending what is being offered. And that's what the teacher would want to see on the faces of their students is like, I get it. You know, that, that wordless, I get it. The aha moment, the upper suit, like, whoa, you tell me what you invented, I get it. I mean, it's like, whoa, it's like we're connected because I'm having, once removed, the same kind of insight that when you had it, no one else had had it. Okay? And this is the beauty of science. I mean, it's, a, it's coming to know something that, and see something or suspect something that no one's ever on the planet seen before, and you have that first. And often it comes out of not knowing. Scientists uh, need to be comf really comfortable with not knowing, because otherwise you're completely oppressed by what everybody else knows and what you are supposed to know. And you forget that, hey, on the tiny little surface of the ocean of not knowing, your little knowing is floating around. But there's this huge potential energy in the not knowing if you can hold it that way. Thinking of insights, scientific insights, uh, inventive insights, uh, is a famous story of Kekulé, the German uh, organic chemist, who uh, there's a statue to him in front of the university in Bonn, you know. And, uh, the famous story of Kekulé is he's trying to figure out the, uh, the chemical structure of benzene. And he was like banging his head against the wall, banging his head. It just won't, the carbons and the hydrogens just would not work out. And then he went to sleep one night, like with this banging going on in his head. And all of a sudden, he had a dream. In the dream, it was a snake swallowing its tail. And he woke up and said, oh, my God, it's a ring. No one had had that thought in organic chemistry ever before, that you could have six carbons in a ring. He didn't do it through thinking. He did it through banging his head against the wall and thinking as far as he could think and then letting go. And often it happens at the edge of sleep. You're, you know, Archimedes in the bathtub. Eureka. Well, that's not just the, the, the territory of an Archimedes or a Kekulé or an Einstein or a Madame Curie. That's basically part of the signature of our genetics, our, our inheritance as humans. And it's not all about your education. It's all, some of it's about re-education or de-education or uneducation. I mean, getting out of our own way so that we can get back to fundamentals. And the fundamental is often, is always, what is this moment? What's unfolding? What is the story I'm generating around it that's probably just a story and not true or not true enough? and that I'm really attached to and I, of course, believe is true. And the only way out of that conundrum is awareness, wakefulness, mindfulness. And to do it in a way that is no separation between what we would call in English mindfulness and what we might call heartfulness. In other words, kind, compassionate, caring for ourselves because in all Asian languages, the word for mind and the word for heart, same word. So if you're hearing mindfulness in English and you have some kind of cognitive behavioral perspective on it, you are like, um, you know, not another planet, wrong galaxy. So it's closer than close. And what I hope to do in this talk is just to give you a little bit of a flavor for, uh, let's just take a moment, listen for the words medicine, to the words medicine, meditation. Mm, a little suspect. Little suspect. When I started MBSR in 1979 at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, the idea of bringing meditation into mainstream academic medicine was tantamount to the Visigoths are at the gates of the citadel of Western civilization, about to tear it down completely. And besides, right behind the first phalanx of meditators come yogis. 
even worse. I mean, now it's going to be yoga and meditation and venting, in, inserting themselves into mainstream medicine. Oh, my God, what's next? I kid you not. I mean, that was the climate. And now it's like meditation, medicine, ho-hum. Everybody thinks they know what it is. No one knows what it is. That's part of the beauty of it. It's like, we know and we don't know. Let's keep the not knowing part. Let's keep reminding ourselves we don't just have another uh, intervention, another modality that we can throw into our basket of integrative medicine modalities. This is something far more profound, far more generative, far more creative, and totally universally distributed. So it's not like it's in one guru or other. What the gurus are doing, guru just means teacher in, you know, Hindi or in Sanskrit, is pointing, pointing out, pointing at something. And it's not saying, oh, look at the finger. It's saying, look where the pointing is going. So if I say, touch base with the sensations uh, in the body now and the breath moving in and out of your body, you don't glom onto my words, you use my words as a vector to invite a feeling for how, how it is in your belly. And the interesting thing is you don't get stupid by doing this. It's like, oh, now I'm going to meditate, I'm going to lose all my you know, cognitive um, juices. You don't get stupider. If anything, you get smarter. Why? Because you know that 99% of everything you think is wrong. And it's also about yourself. And who you think you are is not who you are. So like big mistake on reality. Big mistake. So let me just review what the title of this talk is. Because I thought about it, you know. It's the entanglement of meditation and medicine, okay? The entanglement. Entanglement is now a very popular word in cosmology, in quantum physics, because it seems like the universe is such, according to Bell's theorem and so forth, that um, particles infinitely far apart that could not possibly transmit information at the speed of light between each other are completely entangled in each other that what happens to one, the other knows, in quotation marks, trillions of light years away. Or billions, I'm sorry. And maybe trillions, because we don't go out beyond 13.7 bil uh, billion y light years. 13.7 years, billion years. So there's a kind of entanglement that I'm pointing to as I said, between the words medicine, meditation. And this really, this is what it is. And I learned this from a quantum physicist, not from, from David Bohm, who worked with Einstein and who was also a friend of Krishnamurti's and deeply into the meditative world. Uh, that is medicine. If, uh, they both come from the root meaning, uh, th well, they, they both come from the Latin medere, which means to, to cure. Okay, medere, to cure. But the medere comes from the deep Indo-European root that means to measure. So what does medicine or meditation have to do with measuring? Well, nothing. If what you're thinking of when you think of measure is like, okay, we're going to measure how long, how far it is from here to there in feet, you know, an external standard. It's more the platonic notion that everything has its own right inward measure. So a sphere would be a perfect, it has its own right inward measure. A sphere is not a pyramid. And the pyramid has its own. If it's a tetrahedron or it's whatever, dodecahedron, they all have their own right inward measure. In other words, properties. So medicine is the restoring of right inward measure when it is disturbed. Sometimes through drugs, sometimes through surgery, sometimes through just, and I say just, I shouldn't say just, through deep connection with another human being, with high regard for the other and what they're suffering. Suffering from the Latins to carry what they're carrying. 
and everybody's carrying stuff, all of us. And if we're not now so overwhelmed by it, just wait. Sooner or later, you know, it's part of the human condition. So if medicine is the, uh, the uh, restoring of right inward measure when it's knocked off balance, what would meditation be? It would be the direct perception of your own right inward measure. Now, we say to our patients, because you can say, well, my right inward measure is way off base. I mean, I need surgery, I need radiation, I need chemo, I need uh, amputation. I, what, you know, we need to deliver a lot of care to people. But what, even if you're in that circumstance, what meditation, the word, what mindfulness is saying is, you're already okay. Yes, you didn't need to go through these kinds of procedures and so forth, but the you, the real you, is already whole. It can never be more whole. Even if we had to amputate an arm and a leg, you would still be whole. You would have to deal with the trauma of loss. But your essential humanness, your essential wholeness, and we, s we know this in other people. We look at somebody like Stephen Hawking and say, how can he live in that body? Hmm? How can he live in that body? Not only does he live in that body, he's one of the most extraordinary minds in a body that, you know, has broken down. And it's the same for people with pain and emotional pain and grief and sadness and loss and trauma of all kinds. There is some kind of node or essence that's already okay and always has been, even before the trauma and since the trauma. And the skillful clinician, if you will, has to bring that medicine and meditation together in the direct moment of our perception of welcome, of connection, and then we recruit a certain kind of common humanity to whatever the specifics of treatment are. But that's really that common humanity is what I'm calling the love. Okay? The love. And it's everywhere. I mean, it, it, yeah, I'm guessing, uh, Barney, that you know, if push comes to shove, and I really pushed you and shoved you about why you have created these Osher centers, I am guessing that ultimately we would get down to something that you love, or that uh, you envisaged, that you thought so powerful that it had the potential to offer something beautiful in the world. So I'm using the term love and I'm using the term beauty in that way. And then all the rest is detail. It's really important detail, but it's like if the love's not there, then it's just more stuff that you've created and another building and more employees who are busy thinking they're doing great things, but it's not transformative. It's not healing. Are you with me? Do you feel where I'm going with this? So I don't want to be inflationary about it, but I think we do the opposite often. We don't recognize the beauty. We don't recognize the love. So for, for myself, for instance, I've been meditating since I was like uh, 21 years old. I discovered it at MIT when I was a graduate student in Salvador Luria's laboratory. He won the Nobel Prize while I was a graduate student in his lab. I got to see that whole thing unfold, you know, uh, traveling in those circles. But what touched me in 1965 was a talk on Zen that I happened to go to. All of MIT, seminar hour, you know, like, you know, it's like thousands and thousands of people. And uh, three people came to that talk, in addition to the speaker and the person who invited the speaker. Three people came. I just happened to, you know, sort of by accident, see a poster on the wall. The Three Pillars of Zen, a talk by... Philip Kaplow at the invitation of Houston Smith. I didn't know who Houston Smith was. I didn't know who Philip Kaplow was. I went to that talk, and it blew the top off my head. It's 21 years old. So now I'm 73. So for 52 years, I've been practicing meditation virtually every day. And I'm going to talk about what that means, practicing meditation, because it doesn't just mean this, sitting. Okay? But... I began to feel 
that I had been looking for this my entire life of 21 years, like uh, 21 years. I was like, I've been looking for this my entire life. And what it was was the kind of unification of different ways of knowing things. What my mother would say, because she was an artist, what my father would say, because he was like a super scientist. And like they you know, often didn't understand each other's domains, and I'm young and seeing, wait a minute, there are different ways of knowing. There are different ways of seeing the world. But is there some kind of way to assume all those ways of knowing so that we don't fall onto one side of knowing or another side or some lenses but not other lenses? And somehow that was like in me as a young child, part because of the, uh, the families and stuff like that. But then it was like, holy cow, this is the way to do it. Just sit. Just drop in to the present moment and watch what's unfolding and be the knowing that kind of knows what's unfolding because you're not stupid, because you have awareness, and because you can actually even bring awareness to awareness. So then I, I've been meditating now for 53 years, and at a certain point along that trajectory, I began to realize when I sit in the morning, or let me say when I practice in the morning, it's not always sitting because there are many different doors into it. You can do standing meditation, you can do lying down meditation in bed, you can do walking meditation, sometimes slow, sometimes fast. You can do wheeling meditation, you can do breathing meditation, you can do watching thoughts meditation, a million different, but it's all attending. And what I came to discover or realize was that when I take my seat in the morning, it's a radical act. A lot of people would think it's insane. You got so much to do. Why are you sitting there doing nothing? You know? I can hear my father saying that to me, you know. <laughs> Why are you doing nothing? This is not nothing. It's a non-doing. And what I came to realize is that it's a radical act of sanity, actually, to stop all the doing and the driving through our moments to get the better moments and actually be in the moment that we have. This breath in, this breath out. This thought, this bad feeling, if it's a bad, hard moment, this good feeling, but good, bad, or ugly, the full catastrophe of the human condition, why not put the welcome mat out? Why? Because it's already here. It's completely influencing us. How am I going to be in relationship to it? That's what mindfulness is, the relationality. So I've come to see it as a radical act of sanity and ultimately a radical act of love. By take, I'm taking care, and it's not narcissistic. It's not like radical act of love for myself. It's a radical act of a willingness to be, to remind myself that it's possible to rest in awareness, as we were just doing, and th that awareness is boundless. It's not limited to the skull or to the skin. It's like, you find, try to find the extent of your awareness. I don't think you're going to find it. Try to find the center of it. Even the center, like moi, me, where it, you won't find it. Ex I urge you to experiment. Don't take my word for it. But that's interesting. If this, the boundless spaciousness is inside us in some sense, or part of our true nature, you could say, then who are we, really? And maybe dropping into being outside of time for a few moments at least is kind of like when you have an orchestra they don't just get together and play great music, Mozart, Beethoven, whatever, uh, with great instruments and great performance. They actually tune their instruments to themselves and to each other, right, before they play. What if you see this as a tuning? Before I go into the doing of the day, how about tuning the instrument so that when the first thing that I could get angry about arises, and how long do you think that will take? I noticed the arising of anger. And I noticed that my awareness of the anger isn't angry. You can ask yourself, you can look, and this is not dissociation. This is not a prescription for dissociation. This is like discovering a hidden dimension of your humanity that then you can inhabit. And then all the doing can come out of that being. All the creativity comes out of that all the imagination, and basically all the love. Because the love, you know, we can't talk about it. Anything we say about it turns to, you know, just garbage in our mouths. It's, it's like, because that's all 
mere cognition, merely conceptual, and like, you know, in relationships, like when you're f the love is there and you feel it, words are useless. Maybe poetry, but not, certainly not prose. And when the love's not there, no amount of words <laughs> is going to be of any use. And when the, the love is there, we also don't need words. So medicine and meditation are linked at the etymological hip. And so the thought was, when I um, uh, started MBSR, why keep this to myself? I mean, I'm finding this to be extraordinary. Why not go to places where people are suffering? Because this comes out of the Buddhist tradition primarily, although it's totally universal. But the Buddha was, you could think of him as a, a very sophisticated scientist who asked deep questions about the nature of the mind and the nature of reality, and he didn't have an fMRI and Helen going to you know, go into the M fMRI scanner and with you know sort of uh, uh, artificial intelligence programs decode what's going on when he pays attention to his breathing and so forth. He didn't have that. He didn't even have quantitative EEG. He just had this. And he said, okay, I just have this. I'm going to sit down, and this is going to be the instrument of my inquiry. This is going to be the laboratory. And he discovered some things that are profound, and they have nothing to do with Buddhism in the same way as, you know, uh, gravitation. You know, say, Galileo discovered gravitation, or if you want, Newton did the math. Gravitation's not Italian. Gravitation's not English. It's not like, you know, the sort of Cambridge University is trying to get a patent on gravitation. And, and the Dharma isn't Buddhist. Wisdom is not Buddhist. Awareness is not Buddhist. Mindfulness is not Buddhist. Although it's the heart of Buddhist meditation because Buddhism is not Buddhism. Because as soon as you make an ism of any kind, as soon as you make this, you make that, and that's a dualism. And Buddhism is about non-duality. So there are all sorts of very interesting currents and ironies here that are deep and profound and transformative and wisdom. And it's in some sense the Indo, Europe, uh, the Indo Asian, you know, Indo Tibetan, Indo Chinese culture that is kind of offering us now stuff that a hundred years ago n no one w had a clue about this. I mean. William James was writing about the wandering mind and any kind of education that would help us to deal with a wandering mind would be the education par excellence, he said. Meanwhile, halfway around the world, without the internet, in 1890, there were people who had been practicing that for centuries, how to deal with a, uh, an unruly wandering mind. But no, now, in the 21st century, Everything is out there, everything is everywhere. But the question is, can we bring it inside in a way that is fungible, that is valuable? And so, just to say, uh, before closing, I decided that what I needed to do uh, was, after asking myself for about 10 years, what is my job on the planet, with a capital J? In other words, what would I love so much I'd pay to do it? Yeah, that's my idea of work, you know. I realize it's very privileged. I grew up in a very privileged environment. I went to very privileged schools. But I didn't know I was privileged. I just thought that's the way it was, and I just did what I did, you know. So I was asking the question, what would I love so much I'd pay to do it? And I came up with MBSR, and believe me, I paid to do it for a long time. I mean, it was like, it was not fun, it wasn't easy in a certain way, but it was love. So you said, love doesn't always have to be fun, right? I mean... Any of you who are married, who have children, the love transcends everything. It transcends this and that, good and bad, hard times and beautiful times. I mean, it's like it's always there. And we hopefully don't always need trauma and tragedy in order to remind us of the preciousness of life and that it can even be snuffed out at the age of 14 or 12 or 19 by some madness that our society has not been able to diagnose and deal with well enough to prevent this kind of thing, or is so attached to weaponizing, you know, uh, you know, militias from 1790 that, you know, that that that, that did not have AR-15s. That we're in this circumstance now, where med the world needs medicine. It needs what we've learned in integrative medicine. Let's not keep it to ourselves. We need to bring it into 
the domain of economics and behavioral economics and domain of social justice and equity and why? Because we're generating more and more suffering in humans, but really our karmic assignment is generate less, alleviate the suffering, be of some use before we die. And all of us, it's gonna be over before we know it, no matter how old you are. The good side is there are an infinite number of moments between now and the time you're going to die. To a first approximation, there's still an infinite number of moments, no matter how old you are. How about inhabiting more of them? So the idea of MBSR was to create a clinic in the form of a course that would catch people dropping through the cracks of the healthcare system. And in 1979, there were cracks in the healthcare system. Now, it's chasms. Hmm? And, and challenge them to do something for themselves that no one on the planet can do for you. Starting, with, starting from exactly where you are. If you had four back surgeries and you were in more pain than ever, great. We'd love to work with you as long as you want to work with us. If you can't walk, no problem. Come in anyway, but you have to want to be here. We can't do the motivation part for you. If you have cancer of this kind or another and you're still breathing, our perspective, the more y there's more right with you than wrong with you, no matter what's wrong with you, as long as you're still breathing. We do not have a great track record with the dead, okay? Other people like specialize in, you know, that kind of thing, but that's not, but, you know, so that was the idea behind MBSR. And when, when I talked to doctors about it, the first thing he said, well, I could think of a 20 patients off the top of my head that I would love to send here because I don't know what to do with them. Do you know what I'm saying? It's still the case. And now you folks at the OSHA Center, you have MBSR. You have in spades. It's even in the surgery department. I mean, as we heard in the, in the talk yesterday. I mean, you're doing remarkable things. And, and I guess what I'm here for is to, in some sense, be provocative and challenge you. Because there's a way in which even the remarkable things that get done become normalized. They become, in a certain sense, um, normative. And then you kind of doing MBSR on people rather than letting it still be that exciting, innovative, beyond time and space connectivity. And that has to do with, one, how well the trained the people are who are doing it, uh, two, how deep their own practice is. Now, I think you're at the cutting edge of the curve. So my, my, my sort of, the message I want to leave you with is, is it, I, is it important to be mindful of how easily complacency could set in? And you begi could begin to think, we got this down. Now integrative medicine is, worldwide recognized, we've got seven OSHA centers, it's all fantastic, we're doing amazing work. You are, there's no question about it, at the absolute cutting edge of what's going on in the world. And is there something that still needs a little tuning? And that even a tiny bit of tuning would actually have orthogonally transformative potential. And that's something that you, there's no answer to, it's a question of, can you be with the question and reflect on that in your own practice? Like, what is, what is the next something? How could we, per perhaps it's, how could we teach people how to stay out of the hospital for as long as possible and then to utilize their pra meditation practice when they come into the hospital in concert with their caregivers, you know, so that hospitals now have a different kind of um, um, what's it called? Uh, cost center, where one cost center is devoted to teaching people how to stay out in, of the hospital and not, not use its services, okay? And could you make money out of that? Could you actually have it both ways? The fact that we're all gonna die, uh, the hospitals are not gonna go out of business. But the fact that the burden of stress, pain, and illness and chronic stress, pain, and illness are in our society is enormous. The cost to society are enormous. Is there a way to actually restructure it, remodel it, re-monetize it so that we're actually 
developing businesses that teach people to wake up and to integrate, since we're calling it integrative medicine, that when you take your seat, when you drop in, when it becomes a love affair with the present moment and with actuality and possibility in the face of the full catastrophe of the human condition, your genome's listening, neuroplasticity is listening, your telomeres are listening, all of the science is suggesting that when you do something as weird as nothing or non-doing, you're actually laying down new neural pathways. My colleague Judd Brewer at uh, UMass is you know, showing remarkable things, as is Richie and Helen and hundreds of other neuroscientists. And you know what about these neuroscientists? They were all meditators. They were all meditators. 20 years ago, when Richie was a closet meditator, his, his advisors were al always told him, you let it out that you're a meditator, your career is finished. This is like a career-ending move to bring meditation into neuroscience. Now, all the smart neuroscientist students, they want to do mindfulness. And they have a practice. They've been practicing since they were 10 or 15. There's not just coming to it and then saying, oh, yeah, Richie makes me meditate so I can do the work. No, there's a whole cadre of people who love the meditation practice. That's, and then you get to be the laboratory and also be in the laboratory. And, you know, so it's like you inner and outer are connected in ways that are profound and transformative. So my question to you really is, the entanglement is like a dance. The, the, the dance of mind, body, inner and outer, society, and also what we most love. The true, um, the true um, sort of interior peacefulness, right inward measure. That can be, even the day before you die, you can be equanimous. It's a skill. It's learnable. It doesn't mean everything will become kumbaya, but it means that you will be fully who you are while you have the chance. And then out of that comes beauty, it comes creativity, it comes all sorts of things. So let's take another moment, because I've been talking a lot, and just drop back in to whatever degree you've drifted into thinking let all the reverberations of what I've said just be there in some way or other. But feel, in whatever way you care to, whether the body and the rest of you has any kind of vibrational feeling tone in the aftermath of what was just spoken. And just resting in that awareness. And, you know, in sometimes on meditation retreats, I'll ring bells at the end of a meditation. But see, this meditation is not going to ever end. Okay, so no bells. And talking is good, and walking is good, and working is good, and being in trouble is good, and, you know, being stressed is... It's all good, because your awareness can hold all of it. And your heartfulness can hold it in a way that doesn't blame you or make you a problem or have some kind of... Um, analysis of what's going on that's painful but wrong <laughs> and that's self-inflicted pain. And therefore, the essence of this is liberation. It's freedom. It's freedom. That's what the Buddha said. He said mindfulness is known as the heart of Buddhist meditation. He called it the direct path to liberation. And so it's like the law of gravity. It's like, or, you know, or it's just so, but don't believe Newton or Galileo or Einstein or the, uh, the, the evidence from the LIGO uh, observer observatories that have felt the, f the wiggles of space-time from black holes colliding billions of light years away, gigantic black holes. Believe this. Trust your heart. Be the love. And 
notice that there's no center and no periphery to that either, so that it's, it's a gift that radiates out. Each one of you in a your own particular way. And those of you who work at the OSHA centers, underscore centers, and congratulations for the latest one, why not explore what these growing edges of potentiality are that could easily fall through the cracks of just, we think we got it all, we know it all already. And any institution is capable of that, and it really is the kiss of death. So I encourage you to, out of your own meditation practice, Resting in the knowing and resting in the not knowing and the knowing that knows that the not knowing is much bigger than the knowing. And I'll come back in 20 or 30 years and see how it's going. Okay? <laughs> thank you very much. And I, and I want to thank, and I want to really deeply on a personal level for myself because it's such a gift to the world to thank you, Barney, and to thank you, Maurice, for everything that you're doing to support the, uh, these centers and the, the absolute cutting edge work that is being done here that allows and recruits people who have deep love for this to actually be able to have this be their livelihood and to create something new in the world that medicine is dying for, starving for, and the world is in fact dying for and starving for. So just a deep bow of gratitude to both of you.